Let us now turn our attention to the number of clusters we need to create. Now just to make things clear, of course, we have taken a very simple example in two dimensions. We chose two dimensions because it's easy to show the concepts in two dimensions geometrically. So that's what we are doing here. Okay, so consider the data, the same data that we've been considering thus far. And if you plot a scatter plot of the data, the scatter plot looks like this. You've got age on the x-axis, height on the y-axis, and you see that some of the cases are sitting out here, some of the cases are sitting out here. So if you really looked at saying, okay, I want to break this down into a small number of clusters, a natural solution would be to say, well, it looks like there are two well-defined clusters, right? The first cluster is down here and the second cluster is up there, okay? So we are reducing the complexity by saying, I'm just going to look at it as two sets of uh, students, one with a mean age of something and a mean height of something representing this cluster and the mean age and the mean height of this cluster represents all of the cases in that cluster. Right? So we can reduce the complexity from 12 down to just 2. Right? We can say essentially this uh, two representative cases will represent all of the students. Okay, So that's what we are trying to do. So it's possible just visually to say I'm going to have two clusters. Of course, in reality, we are not going to do it visually because first of all, you're going to have far more cases, not just 12. You're going to have thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands of cases. And secondly, it's not going to have just two dimensions. It's going to have many more dimensions. So clearly, this is not something that we can do visually. And therefore, we need cluster analysis to help us to identify the clusters. Okay, so cluster one, from the previous figure, right? So I'm calling this as cluster one and that as cluster two, right? So cluster one has these following ages and heights and cluster two has the following ages and heights. And this is the mean age and mean height for cluster one, mean age and mean height for cluster two, okay? So what we are effectively saying is we can look at the data as just two clusters, one cluster in which all the students have age 9.78 and height 53.62 and another cluster in which all the students have age 13 and height 69. Okay, so we've reduced the complexity from 12 just down to 2. Of course, somebody else may come along and say, no, 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 I see three clusters in the data. There's that first cluster on, uh, you know, this is the first cluster, there's the second cluster and that's the third cluster. Perfectly fine. There's really no hard and fast rule that says, two clusters is the correct answer, three clusters is the wrong answer, right? As I've already discussed earlier, what we are trying to do is to achieve a compromise between the extremes. And what is the correct number of clusters depends on the context, depends on the purpose for which this is being used. It's a very subjective thing. There's nothing objective about the number of clusters. And we'll try to make it as objective as possible as we go forward. So as we have said earlier, and as you can see from all of these diagrams that we are looking at, we want the cases in the cluster to be more similar to each other than the cases which are in other clusters. In other words, we are talking about the coherence of a cluster. Coherence of the cluster is essentially the extent to which the cases in the cluster are similar to each other. Okay. So obviously, what would be a cluster with the highest coherence? The highest coherence possible is when all the cases are completely identical to each other. Okay, that is the highest coherence or the lowest amount of variability, right? Coherence means that they're all very similar, so there's no variability, right? So obviously, highest coherence you're going to get when all the cases are identical to each other. That will be the perfect cluster. So suppose you have a cluster that has four students and all the students have the same age, 10, and all the students have the same height, 53. Well, that cluster is as coherent as you can get. The variety is zero. So once again, what is the highest overall coherence? You have to put create only perfect clusters, create only perfect clusters. So in this case, if you want to create only perfect clusters from this data set, then you would have to put each case in its own cluster, right? But you've got perfect coherence. But of course, theoretically, this is perfect because it's every case in a cluster is very coherent. They're all 
uh, all the cases in the cluster are identical in this case this is an extreme case because each case is its own cluster we've got 12 clusters of size 1 so this is theoretically perfect but of course it's useless in practice because it doesn't meet the needs that we are trying to achieve right we want to create coherent clusters but we want the number of clusters to be significantly smaller than the total amount of data that is we want to also reduce complexity here we have reduced uh, increased coherence but we have not achieved nothing in terms of reducing complexity so this is useless in practice okay so clearly you'll have to be willing to accept imperfect clusters in other words you're not going to get completely coherent clusters in cluster analysis you have to admit that that's really not possible in practice so in practice we're going to have some amount of variability in the clusters but we want that uh, elements in a cluster to be as close to each other as we can get okay so clearly once again you see the same trade-off that we talked about earlier there is a trade-off between the number of clusters and the overall coherence so once again returning to the clustering that we did earlier so we are saying the cases in each cluster are similar to each other right similar in the sense that they're all sort of bunched together or close together so similarity is all about distance right so we are saying these things are similar to each other why because they are physically close to each other which means the distance between them is much smaller than the distance from any one of them to points in other clusters so clustering is really all about distance geometric distance in data analytics whenever we talk about distance we have to become sensitive to an important aspect so for example here I'm considering a different data set just to illustrate I have a data set with in which you've got people uh, with certain incomes and the number of cars they own don't worry about the fact that this data set is really not really meaningful or anything but what we are saying is I've got a data set and I've got some other new person who's got an income of 85,000 and they have two cars okay so here the first person for example has income of 95,000 and one car second person has an income of 120,000 and two cars and so on so now we want to find out the distance between this case and other cases in the data set okay we are trying to compute the distance uh, between this case and some other cases okay so first of all let's consider the uh, first case if you want to consider the first case which is 95,001 and forget the ownership of both we are not interested in that so uh, and we want to find the distance to this between uh, from 85,000 comma 2 right so this is one point 85,000 comma 2 that is another point 95,000 comma 1 what is the distance between them how close are they to each other of course we know that if you think thought of it simply as a point in two-dimensional space then we can easily use the distance formula which will simply be square root of 95,000 minus 85,000 squared plus 1 minus 2 the whole squared that is x1 minus x2 the whole squared plus y1 minus y2 the whole squared and square root of that that is the distance okay so now let's take a look at some other possible cases okay so here are two cases we already calculated the distance as 10,000 okay 95,000 1 85,000 2 the distance is 10,000 if you apply the formula okay now let's consider another case in which we increase the salary by 50 95,000 and 50 now you would think of this as a very small increase in salary because look salary is such a big number 95,000 and we are just increasing it by a small number like 50 and this case is the same but now if you compute the distance the distance between them now becomes uh, 10,000 and 50 that is if you increase the salary by 50 which is a very small increase in salary the distance increases by 50 okay now let's consider the original case 95,000 but increase the number of cars from 1 to 3 that is a significant increase in the number of cars right because one car to three cars that's three times the original number of cars of course though we are still considering this case now if you compute the distance distance is practically the same as 10,000 you know it's if you round off it just comes to 10,000 why because 2 minus 3 difference is nothing much okay so it literally it's it's a very small number okay so you see that 
A big increase in the number of cars had no impact on the distance. A small increase in the salary had a considerable influence in terms of distance. Okay. In fact, let's increase the number of cars not to three but to five. Distance still is only ten thousand, right? So what we are seeing here is that increases in an income they tend to dominate distances. Number of cars plays no role almost in the computing of distance. It plays a very small role. Okay, so distance has become insensitive to the number of cars and is very sensitive to the income. Okay, clearly that is happening because of the magnitude in which we are expressing incomes. All the income numbers are much higher and they tend to dwarf the number of cars. Okay, so therefore Differences in number of cars will not play any role in terms of calculating similarity. So two cases will be considered as similar to each other only if their incomes are similar. The number of cars doesn't play any role in this, even though we know that because of the scale in which the number of cars is represented, one and three, there's a huge difference. Whereas between an income of 95,000 and 95,003, there's hardly any difference at all. But the income differences will show up as much more significant than number of cars differences. So to combat this problem, we generally apply the principle or a technique of standardization of the data, right? So instead of working with the original data, so we've got the income and age. Uh, this is another data set I'm considering. Just again, you can see there's a big difference between the scales of incomes and ages. Right. So what you do is for each item, you calculate the mean and the standard deviation. So the mean of income is 444, 44,462.8 and the standard deviation is 8,691. 8, Similarly, for the age, we've got the mean and the standard deviation and then we calculate X minus mean divided by standard deviation for every number. And that is generally referred to as the Z value in statistics, right? So the Z value is nothing but saying how many standard deviations away from the mean a particular value is, right? Because you're saying X minus mean, that is how far away from the mean it is divided by standard deviation, right? So you're saying this is 1.5 standard deviations away from the mean or, you know, 0.8 standard deviations away from the mean and so on, okay? Or it could be minus, could be negative as well for values which are less than the mean. Okay, so basically for every value, you're just seeing how many standard deviations away from the mean it is, and you're going to do that for both income and age. Okay, so this is just showing you an example of calculation of uh, uh, Z values. Okay, so here what we are doing is we are seeing the original values and the normalized or standardized values. Okay, now see that incomes and ages are pretty much on comparable scales because the mean value for both of them will be at exactly zero and a value which is one standard deviation away uh, on the positive side will be one no matter if the income is 95,000 and the number of cars is just one or two or three right so if the, the average will still be zero one standard deviation away from the mean will be one it doesn't matter the, re the absolute magnitude of the numbers doesn't uh, they don't matter okay so now both attributes become commensurate meaning they they can be measured together. You can compare them. Okay, so that's the whole idea of standardization. 